Hello, and welcome back to the Maker Jane channel, where I share all things English paper piecing, from tips and tutorials to projects and more. So if you love EPP like I do, please consider subscribing. In this video, I'm gonna show you how I stitch together hexagon English paper pieces into rows. And there are many different types of ways to stitch hexagons together, and stitching them in rows is one of those ways. So I thought I would share with you today how I go about the process and give you some tips and some tricks that I use to make the stitching process easier and more fun. Today we're going to be working with hexagon EPP shapes that have already been basted and are ready to stitch. So if you'd like to learn how to glue baste hexagons, you can refer to this video up here in which I give you a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to glue baste your hexagon templates to your fabric. If you're brand new to English paper piecing and you are like to get familiar with the supplies that you need before you get into the actual English paper piecing, check out the links down below in the description. I've got all of the tools and supplies that I personally use and recommend, so you can check those out, including how to get your hands on some free templates so that you can try it out and see if you like English paper piecing before you really dive in. Um, you can check out the video here. In addition to that link below, it gives you step-by-step -step tutorial on how to download the free templates, cut them out, and make your own at home. If you are more experienced with English paper piecing and you don't really want to have to make your own at home and you just prefer to have them pre-cut for you, I also have pre-cut hexagon templates available in my shop and I'll be sure to link to that down below as well. All right, let's head over to the table and we will take a look at how to sew hexagons together into rows. So the first thing we want to do is, if we're working especially from a pattern, we want to make sure that our hexagons are laid out in the order that we want to stitch them in. Once we've got our hexagons in order, we are going to pick up the first two hexagons. So we're going to start here at the top, and I like to pick up the top one and flip it over so that it's face down on the next one, because we want to stitch along this seam that joins them. So go ahead and pick up your hexagon shapes. And the first thing we want to do before we even start stitching is we want to make sure that we're lining up our corners. So you can look at it from this angle. You can look at it from this angle. You, you basically, you don't want it to be off at all. You want your, your edges on the sides to line up as best as possible. And then I always double check the corners and make sure those line up as well. And the first thing I always like to do is bury my thread in the seam allowance. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that real quick. And you just basically just skim it under the surface of that seam allowance and bring it up right next to the corner of the hexagon that's on top. And don't pull the thread all the way through. I like to leave a little tail and I just put my thumb over that to kind of hold it while I'm stitching. So I always like to start my hexagons or any English paper piecing shape with a knot. And I knot on both ends. I knot at the starting point and the ending point. And that just helps everything stay secure because once you start stitching your pieces together, uh, you wanna make sure that your stitches are secure. And so knotting at the beginning and the end just helps with that. And we're not making a huge knot. This is just a very tiny knot. Um, you can see I've taken the needle right through the, at the corner. Okay, you see the corner there? And I'm only picking up a couple of threads from each fabric. So we'll pull that through, and then this next stitch is going to be our knot. And basically it's just a loop knot. So you take one more stitch, and before you pull it all the way through, we're going to send our needle through that loop and pull tight. So that is my knot. And then I'm just going to do a simple whip stitch all the way down this line. Picking up only a couple of threads from each fabric to minimize how much thread shows on the front. 
And my stitches are fairly close together. I would say they're probably about a sixteenth of an inch apart. That might translate into a couple of millimeters for those of you who are using the metric system. Okay, now that I've reached the end, I've taken one stitch already right at the end. That's right on the corner there. You can see my needle coming up right there. So I've already taken one stitch. I'm gonna take one more stitch. And before I pull it all the way through, we're gonna go through that loop and knot it. So we have our first two hexagons stitched together. The next thing we wanna do is we want to add the next hexagon in the row. But before we do, we need to get our thread to this edge. That's the next edge we're going to stitch to. And I like to work with a continuous thread. So I do not cut my thread in between each of my pieces. I have gotten into the habit of just carrying my thread underneath the seam allowance. So we started here, I'm just going around underneath the seam allowance. And the reason I'm not going directly across is because I need to get my paper out later and I don't want my thread to be in the way of me doing that. So before I pick up the next piece, I'm gonna go ahead and bury my thread, just like I did with the first piece and get it ready for, uh, for where we're gonna stitch. So we just do that and I bring it up of right close to that edge where we're going to start stitching. Then I like to place everything down again just to make sure I'm in the correct order. And again, if you're following a pattern, you want to make sure you do this. Um, this is a scrappy project, so it's not as critical. But if you are following a pattern and the, your colors need to go in a certain order, it's always a good idea to just place everything back down on the table, make sure it's correct, and then go ahead and pick up the next two pieces. So again, I'm just going face down on that next piece and we're going to stitch along that top seam. And I've already got my thread there in the one piece. So we've already buried the thread. We don't need to worry about that. And again, we're just checking our corners, making sure everything's nice and lined up and flat. Our corners look good. Our edges here look good. And we can go ahead and begin stitching. And again, this first uh, first couple stitches, we're going to tie our little knot and then we will stitch along this edge, tie a knot here, and we'll have a row of hexes started. So I'm going to go ahead and stitch across here and knot, and then I'm going to show you the next step in sewing together a row. Okay, for this next step, I'm gonna go ahead and kind of move everything out of the way. And we're gonna use these, since I already have these rows stitched together. Let me just move these out of the way. And we'll take a look at these rows. We wanna line up our rows, make sure they're in the correct order that we want them in. And then we need to, um, we need to get the seam lined up so that we know where we're gonna be stitching. Now with rows, it's, it's a little bit different than doing like a hexagon flower, for example. And the reason is because we have these different angles here and we want to stitch all the way down this line. So what happens is when we go to sew a row together, we have these different angles and each angle is going to require us to maneuver our fabric and our pieces in such a way that can be a bit challenging uh, as you're stitching. So if you see, we're gonna start along this angle right here, okay? So in order to do that, I have to flip this entire row 
over along that seam line, keeping that seam line lined up right here. But you can see what it did to the angle of the row itself, okay? So I'm going to be stitching right here, but now I have this like heavy, kind of heavy because there's papers in it, uh, and they're going at odd angles and it just gets a little precarious to hold. So what I like to do is I like to grab a needle minder. And if you've never heard of a needle minder, I have a video, I'll link to it up here in the video that you can check out on what a needle minder is and how I use needle minders with my English paper piecing. But I'm gonna show you one example of how I do that in today's video. So basically a needle minder is just two magnets. Um, the, the front of it can be made out of anything really. I have made this using a vintage button. If you'd like to see more of the needle minders that I have available in my shop, I'll link to those down below so you can check that out. But basically the needle minder is what I use to help me hold on to these pieces. I take the back of the magnet off, I put it under my work and I just hold it right there with my finger. Okay, as you can see there. And then I take the front of the needle minder and I just drop it on the top and it automatically attaches to itself, okay? Now you can see my hexagons aren't lined up right now and that's fine. I just do that, I just initially get the needle minder attached to the work. So now it's on there, it's not going anywhere. Now what I do is I go back and I adjust the angle of everything so that my edges line up along that seam allowance that I wanna stitch. And everything looks good. And so I take my left hand, my non-stitching hand, and I put it between those two tails of hexagon rows. I just kind of slip it right underneath there and I hold it lightly like this. Basically the needle minder is going to help us hold this seam in place so that we don't have to be gripping our work and getting carpal tunnels and getting hand strain and all of that. So I, I love the needle minder for this. Um, and once you get your stitch started, it's not gonna shift like this. You can see it shifted just a little bit because I've been moving it around. So I'm going to make sure that I get the edges lined up one more time. And we're gonna go ahead and start stitching. So let me grab my needle and we're just gonna start it the same exact way we started it before. We're gonna bury the thread, come up right near that corner and we'll leave a little tail. I'm gonna hold that lightly with my thumb and then I'm gonna take my first two stitches knotting right there at that corner. And there's that loop. So we're gonna pull that thread through and knot it up. So now, now that that corner is secured, this needle minder is holding everything to the left of that point. So now I'm moving this and you see my angles aren't shifting, okay? This is why I love the needle minder. So now I can take my hand to the most comfortable position uh, and just move your hand to the most comfortable position for you, for your stitching. So I like to have my hand under my work as I'm stitching the seam on the top. And your hand positioning may be different, um, but what I love about the needle minder is I can position my hand wherever is most comfortable. I don't have to grip and hold in these very uncomfortable positions to hold that seam in place because it's already being held in place by this little guy, okay? So I'm just gonna stitch along this seam and I'm gonna knot at the end. And when I'm done doing that, I'll show you the next step. Okay, so now that we have that seam done, now we need to shift everything so that we can get to the next seam. So in order to do that, we remove our needle minder 
and we unfold the seam that we just stitched so that our two rows are laying flat side by side. The next seam that we want to sew is this one here. So again, in order to sew that seam, we have to flip it face over onto this hexagon. Now you can see it doesn't want to flip so easily because we have this guy here that we just sewed. So what you'll have to do is I bend my template slightly, just enough to fold this over on along that seam there. And notice I'm not creasing this hexagon that I just sewed. I don't like to crease my templates because one thing I love about the pre-cut templates that I sell in my shop is they're made out of cardstock and you can reuse them multiple times for multiple projects. And the more that you crease them, the faster they break down and the faster you'll have to replace them. So if I have to bend my project like this, I, I won't push this together and create a really strong crease. I just kind of let it bend naturally without forcing it. And this is another reason why I love the needle minder because it's going to really help as we start having to bend our pieces. So you can see here, I have a little bit of a gap along the seam that we're going to be stitching. And that's because I have decided not to crease my template. And that's totally fine. We're going to close up that gap in just a second. First thing I want to do is I want to get my needle minder on my project so that it can hold these pieces together for me so that I can then move my hands around and not have things shuffle. Okay, so I'm just grabbing that back magnet again and I'm going to grab the front the needle minder and stick it together and there we go now I can just let go and it's holding it together for me right there okay so now you can come in and just adjust if you need to make any adjustments uh, mine didn't need to be adjusted it was already in place so I can go ahead and start stitching so I'm going to go ahead and do that my thread is already in the place it needs to be because we just finished the seam, uh, this seam right here that it brought me right to where I need to be. So I'm going to adjust my hands to the most comfortable position. I don't need to bury my thread because we're already in position right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close up this gap with our first stitch. And it's very critical when you're sewing together any shapes, but especially your hexagons, when you're at the corners, when you're at the intersection of two seams, it's critical that you make sure you get your stitches right in there at the corner, at that intersection where your seam begins and ends. If you don't do that, if you start your stitch further back, even just a little bit, you can end up with holes in your finished work. So you'll have all your pieces sewn together, but right in between them, where those seams intersect, you might get a little tiny hole that may be visible depending on what color batting you use behind your work. So it's important that you bring your needle in and take that first stitch right at that tip, as close to that tip uh, or corner of your pieces as possible. So we're going to take that first stitch and we're going to go ahead and take the second stitch in exactly the same spot and I'm going to knot off right there. And now I can stitch along this edge and again my needle minder is holding everything nice and tight for me so I can let go and the weight of these isn't going to shift anything around. So I'll just stitch along here and knot at the end and then we'll continue down the row. So this is the next seam we're gonna work on. We're going to flip everything over so that that seam is face to face. Those two pieces are face to face. Again, we have to fold our, our uh, template here, but I'm not creasing it. I'm just letting it naturally fold and I'm gonna attach my needle minder. And we're ready to go again. 
So I'm gonna take two stitches and knot, and then sew along this seam, knot at the end, and then we'll go to the next seam. And we'll continue doing that all the way down the row until we get to the end. Another thing that I like about the needle minder is that it will hold your needle while you're adjusting your pieces. So you don't have to keep putting your needle down. And that's actually a habit that I'm still getting into is putting my needle onto my needle minder because sometimes I forget it's there. Even though it's holding my pieces together, oftentimes I forget that I can still use it to hold my needle as well. <laughs> So um, so that's really great. You don't have to put your needle down and, you know, it just saves time. Every time you set your needle down and have to go pick it up again, uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just can't seem to pick my needle up because it's such a fine needle, it's hard to grab. And I like to save time as much as possible. So rather than having to fidget, trying to pick the needle up, it's nice that it's right there for me when I'm ready to start stitching. Okay, I've gotten my two rows stitched together all along this center seam. I still have my papers in and I can add a third row here. Once I add that third row, it's time to start thinking about removing some papers. So I had three rows of hexagons stitched together before I removed any papers. It then came time to add a fourth row. I decided to remove the papers from this row to reduce the weight as well as help keep it flexible so that it's easier to hold in my hands as I'm adding rows to my project. I can more easily fold and kind of maneuver that fabric in my hand so that I can hold it in my hand. Each progressive row that you add, you can remove the next row of papers. If I was gonna add this row onto this one, we don't wanna remove these papers because we need the papers here to hold that firm edge because that's where we're stitching. So we'll leave these papers in. We'll leave the papers in for the two rows that we're stitching, but the row inside of that, we can remove those papers and that will help soften up the project. And of course, we want to leave the papers in that are on the end. So a good way of thinking about it is any shape that has all of its sides contained by a seam, you can remove the papers. Any shape that has any sides that are still exposed, like all of these sides here on the edges, those are the pieces that you want to leave in until you're ready to move on to the next phase of English paper piecing, which is to start creating your quilt. So hopefully you can see how you can start building and creating hexagon rows in such a way where you can create a large section of fabric just using rows of hexagons, and you can remove some of your papers to help make assembling it easier. All right, that's how I stitch together hexagons into rows. And this is a very versatile stitching technique. You can use it for all sorts of English paper piecing projects, including and especially if you're making a quilt entirely out of hexagons. There are multiple ways to sew hexagons together. So be sure to subscribe and stay tuned because in the near future, I'm gonna be making more videos on different ways to stitch your hexagons together. Remember to check out the links that I have down below in the description for you. And if you liked this video, please click the like button. It really helps me get seen more on YouTube and helps others like you find my videos. And remember to subscribe so that you don't miss out on any of my future videos. I hope you liked this video. I hope it was helpful for you and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, keep on stitching. I can't think of what to say. <laughs> Just start talking. Just start talking.